Good morning. Welcome to Millersburg Christian Church this morning. We are glad you're here. If you're visiting with us this morning, please make it your priority to, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, so I just had to make something up there. (laughs) But stop by and see me after the service, and uh, we have a gift for you, and I'd love to get to meet you as well, so please stop by and see me. Uh, Would you join me in prayer? Uh, God, we just come to you right now. We thank you for uh, just this opportunity to worship you. Uh, because great is your glory. And we just come to you right now and we praise your most holy name. We come to you right now and we lift the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he's done. We thank you for the life he's given us. And right now, as we get into your word, may it speak to us, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to start with a question, and it's not an easy question. And the question is, what is the purpose of your life? Now, over the years, I've asked people that question, and that most of the time, people have to stop and they have to kind of search, what is the purpose of my life? So I want you to think about that, and I want you in your bulletin this morning in the outline, there's even a line there for you to fill in that says, I'm living for. I'm living for. What, what are you living for? How would you complete that sentence? I'm living for. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're continuing in our series today called The Game of Life. And in this series, we're going through the book of Philippians and looking at different aspects of life. And Paul is going to teach us today the purpose of life. But to really understand and appreciate the context of what we're going to be talking about today, I want you to understand what is happening here. Now, I know a couple weeks ago, when we started this series, I gave you some background information on Paul and where he's at at this point, but I want to I hit rewind again, and I want to go back about five years in the life of Paul so that you can see what is going on. And I want you to know this, if Paul's life were my life, <laughs> at this point I would be asking, God, what's the purpose of this? I mean, really, is this, is this what you really want? Why is this happening to me? God, surely this isn't your purpose for my life. So here's what's happening. Five years earlier, Paul finds himself worshiping in a temple in Jerusalem with some friends, very much like what we're doing here this morning, okay? They're worshiping, but outside of the temple, there are some angry Jews, and they have it out for Paul. And so they begin to spread rumors about Paul, and then all of a sudden, this angry mob forms, they rush into the temple, they grab Paul, they drag him outside the temple, and they begin to beat him to death. That was their plan, to beat him to death. Now, if this were me at this point, this is where I'd be going, God, you know, what's the purpose of this? I thought you wanted me to be healthy and safe. And a lot of people think that's my purpose in life, to be healthy and safe. But that wasn't the purpose of Paul's life. Well, the Roman commander hears about what's happening down the street, so he grabs some of his soldiers, he heads down the street to break up the fight. Not because... He's concerned about Paul, but because it's his job to keep the peace. When he gets there, Paul is pretty bloodied up, and, uh, but at least he's breathing. I mean, he's, he's alive. The commander just assumes that Paul must be guilty of something in order to receive such a whooping, so he arrests Paul, and he takes him to prison to interrogate him. But he's going to interrogate him Jack Bauer style, all right? Most of you don't remember 24, do you? I I mean, I know it's been a few years, but he's going to interrogate him Jack Bauer style. I mean, he is going to beat a confession out of Paul. So they secure Paul. They're getting ready to whip him. The soldier has the whip in the air. When Paul says, whoa, whoa, guys, I didn't realize it was okay for you to beat a Roman citizen who has not been charged with a crime. The soldiers look at each other. They stop. They didn't realize Paul was a Roman citizen. So now they're not sure what to do. I mean, if they beat him, they're going to be the ones who go to prison for beating a Roman citizen without a charge. The Roman commander doesn't know what to do here. He has arrested a Roman citizen who hasn't really been charged with anything. He can't let him go because if he lets him go, there's an angry mob of Jews outside that are ready to kill Paul. So here's what he does. He waits until night. In the middle of the night, he takes Paul and he sends him with 500 guards off to the city of Caesarea, which is about 50 miles away. He sends him to Governor Felix. 
in Caesarea. He sends a note that basically says, hey, I found this Roman citizen. They were trying to kill him. The Jews were trying to kill him, but I saved his life. And so I'm sending him to you, and his accusers are going to come to you and make their case, O great Felix. So this commander basically successfully hands off this hot potato by the name of Paul to Felix in Caesarea. Well, the next day, Paul's accusers come and make their case against Paul. The governor starts to realize this is not your average ordinary citizen. He's got a lot of enemies, but he's also got a lot of friends. So what the governor does is he keeps Paul in prison for two years. Two years without any charges, without any convictions, Paul is in prison. And the governor, in his mind, he's thinking Paul's friends will come up with a bribe to get Paul released. Now, if that were me sitting in a prison without any charges against me, knowing that I'm innocent, unjustly held, I'd be saying, God, what is your purpose in this? I thought you wanted my life to be comfortable, and I thought you wanted my life to be secure. And that's what a lot of people think life is about, being comfortable and being secure. But that wasn't the purpose of Paul's life. So two years go by, Felix is no longer the governor, a new governor comes in, he assesses the situation, and he decides, well, the best thing to do is send him back to Jerusalem. That's where it started, that's where it can end. But Paul knows if he goes back to Jerusalem, it's going to be a one-way ticket. And so he plays the last card that is available to him as a Roman citizen. He says, I want to appeal to Caesar. This is like appealing to the Supreme Court. Every Roman citizen had the right to appeal to Caesar. So Paul is put on a ship with a group of prisoners, and they head off for Rome. But during the night, on the open seas, this huge storm blows in, and just when you think it can't get any worse, they hit some rocks with the ship. The ship just falls to pieces. Everyone's grabbing for something that will float. They end up floating into the, this island where they spend the winter season until another ship comes and picks them up and takes them to Rome. When Paul gets to Rome, he's put under house arrest, which basically means he has to rent this small room, which I figured probably isn't really all that nice, and he's chained to a guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He has to pay the rent on this room. And if he can't pay the rent, then he's going to be thrown into a dungeon where he will most certainly die. He doesn't know where he stands with Caesar. He doesn't know if Caesar's going to let him off, if he's going to be executed, if he's going to be set free. I mean, this is Paul's life for five years. Now, if that were me, I'd be saying, God, what is the purpose of this? I thought you wanted me to be prosperous and blessed. And a lot of people think that's the purpose of life, to be prosperous and to be blessed, to be happy, to be carefree. But that wasn't the purpose of Paul's life. So Paul is under house arrest, and he's sitting there. He doesn't realize it, but as he's sitting there, he's writing a good chunk of the New Testament. He's writing to different churches, and one of the churches he writes to is the church in Philippi. And basically, he's writing a thank you note. And that's why, because they had helped him with the rent that he had to pay while he's under house arrest, and they had sent money to him. And so that's why he begins his letter, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, where he says, our memory verse, remember it? I thank my God every time I remember you. And he goes on to explain to the church how God is still at work. That God is still accomplishing his purposes even though it doesn't seem like it. You see, Paul's life, his life was not about being comfortable and secure. It wasn't about being prosperous and wealthy. It wasn't about being carefree and having an easy life. He captures the purpose of his life in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, when he says this. He says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's your memory verse for this week. So let's say it together. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Right, another easy one for you, all right? So you'll be quizzed, all right, on that. When Paul talks about his purpose in life, now what I want you to notice is, if you could put that back up, What I want you to notice is his purpose isn't about what. 
It's still not there. His purpose isn't about what. His purpose is about who. Who? Who? That's the deeper question. Who is the purpose of life? And, and for him, it was Christ. Now, most of us would say, well, you know, my purpose in life is for me to be blessed. It's for me to be happy. It's for me to be healthy. It's for me to be wealthy. It's for me to be comfortable, secure. But living the Christian life is not living for ourselves. The purpose of the Christian life is to live for Jesus Christ. And then we're going to read in this chapter how that's kind of lived out. So turn back to Philippians chapter, or not chapter, but verse 12. Philippians 1, verse 12. This is what Paul says. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, he wants them to know that you would think life would go this way. You know, this is the way life should go. This is the way things should happen. But it didn't really happen this way. But still, but still, I want you to understand it's okay. It's okay because God has used it. Verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So here he is, five awful years of his life. And he says, I want you to know it's all good. It's all good because what has happened has really served to advance the gospel. So living for Christ means that you are living to advance the gospel. That's why at Millersburg Christian Church, our mission is change lives every day. Well, how do we change lives every day? We do that by connecting people to Jesus Christ, a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So this year, we will give $33,000, somewhere in that area, to missions to help people advance the gospel across the world. That's why we have the baby gap ministry. That's why we have the school supply ministry at this church to help families in this community in their time of need. That's why we are looking at the future of our building and what we want to do and how we can best help this community. And I know a lot of people go, oh, we don't need it. We don't need it. This is fine. This is great. This building's in good shape. Well, it's not really. And and here's the thing. We have to make room for more. And that was never more evident than it was two weeks ago when we had 118 kids in here and 60 volunteers for VBS. And if we don't make more room for more, we can't draw more people to Christ. And if I can be really candid with you, there's one specific area that I'm really worried about when it comes to advancing the gospel. And we're doing okay here. And that was evident through VBS. That's evident through a growing youth ministry. But I'm really concerned worldwide about advancing the gospel to the next generation. The truth is we cannot afford not to advance the gospel to the next generation. The truth is it is possible for there to be a building somewhere in Millersburg that says Millersburg Christian Church 50, 60 years from now, and it could be like one of the cathedrals in Europe where they come and they take tours of what once was. And so people come to Amish country, and they go on an Amish country tour, and one of the stops they make is this building with the name Millersburg Christian Church on it, but there's no one no longer meeting there. And someone asked, hey, why doesn't anyone meet here anymore? Well, because they didn't advance the gospel to the next generation. And you can say, well, Wes, you're crazy. But let me tell you something. Every day, every week in the United States, churches are closing their doors. Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches are closing their doors because they are not advancing the gospel to the next generation. Nationwide, the statistics are alarming. The former vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention did a report to the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee, and he said this. He said, we are losing our children. Research indicates that 70% of our teens who are involved in church group will stop coming to church within two years after high school graduation. Josh McDowell did a study, and he talked to two leaders of evangelical denominations, and each one of them said, reported separately, that 94% and 95% of their students are going off to college and abandoning the faith. And what's even more alarming is they aren't coming back. And I've expressed this concern to mature Christians, well-meaning Christians, who look at me and they go, well, Wes... They'll come back. They'll come back. But never mind the fact that in that time period, they are deciding who they're going to marry. They have started having kids, and they've picked their career for life. And I'm telling you, more and more, they're not coming back. 
And even if those statistics are only half true, let's say it's 35% to 47%, something has to be done. We cannot afford to be distracted by differences. We can't be held back by resources. Sacrifices are going to have to be made. Preferences are going to have to be set aside. We cannot make excuses because the gospel has to be advanced to the next generation. This cannot be something that we just say we're about. It has to be something that we are truly about. And I've noticed when I talk to people about their purpose in life, here's what happens. A lot of people say, well, you know, yeah, I can fill in that blank. I am living for and they can fill it in all nice, but, but are we really doing it? I mean, are we actually showing it? Are we, are we truly living it out? Several years ago, I decided to take a um, late evening bike ride, and I wanted to get a ride in before it got dark, and so I thought I'll go out and do a quick 15, 20 miles. And uh, so I take off on the bike, and I get it out several miles, and all of a sudden, there's just this big clap of thunder and lightning. And I'm like, well, far enough. Let's turn this baby around. So I turn around. I'm heading back to home. And all of a sudden, it's like clear skies. I'm like, all right, this is my opportunity. So I take a turn where I can make the route just a little bit longer. I get about two more miles out, and all of a sudden, the sky has just opened up and poured down the rain. So it's pouring down the rain. It's hitting my sunglasses as I'm trying to ride. I can't see hardly anything in front of me, just a little bit of the road. And I must have hit something because all of a sudden I hear my back tire go, pouring down rain, flat tire. So I'm like, great. I get off the bike. I take off the tire. I put the new tube in. And I've got this CO2 pump. You screw a CO2 cartridge into this pump. You stick it on the stem of the bike tube. And it inflates it like immediately. Well, in the rain, I guess I wasn't paying attention. I screwed it on. And I'm screwing it on. I'm screwing it on crooked. And as soon as it pops, it goes, and all my air is gone. Great. No cell phone because I'm going for a short bike ride. You can't run in road biking shoes. And so what do you do? I throw the bike on my shoulder, and I begin to walk. And I'm thinking, surely somebody will stop and pick me up, right? And I even see, I see in the distance, yes, here comes a deputy sheriff. He will stop. He'll at least call someone for me. He's going to see that I'm in trouble. I'm carrying a bike in the rain. Woo! Doesn't even slow down. Here's what I think in my mind. To protect and to serve? Really? But listen, there's this inconsistency in our lives as well. Because we say we're about one thing, but then we don't necessarily reflect that. However, Paul, he's, he's all about advancing the gospel. He talks about it. Look at verses 13 and 14. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of my brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. He says, because of the situation that I find myself in, actually God's word is being advanced. Now what's happening here? He's chained. He's chained to a guard that's probably about, the chain's probably about three to four feet long. He's chained to a different guard every six hours, 24 hours a day. There were about 12,000 palace guards. Now these are some of the most elite hand-picked guys in the military, right? I mean, these guys would serve in these positions for a few years, and then they would oftentimes be promoted off to military and political positions. So Paul possibly is chained to men who are going to be Roman leaders later on. One commentator put it this way. Paul wasn't chained to them. They were chained to him. And I can imagine every time a new guard came in that Paul would get this little smirk on his face. (laughs) Time for me to hit up another one. I'm going to advance the gospel on this guy. And in verse 14, I want you to notice the phrase. He says, because of my chains. Because of my chains. Because of my chains, the very thing that you would think would keep me from fulfilling my purpose is the means that is actually accomplishing Paul's, God's purpose in Paul's life. Because of my chains. So here's my question. Do you find yourself chained to something that is keeping you from fulfilling your purpose in life? That you think is keeping you from really living? 
Maybe you're chained to a dead-end job or coworkers that you just don't like. And you pray, God, just, just get me out of this job. God, just get me away from these coworkers. God, make one of them resign, whatever. But maybe God has you chained in that for you to fulfill his purpose in your life. Maybe you're chained to a bad marriage. You're married to someone you don't love, someone you don't respect. Maybe you're not attracted to them anymore. And you're thinking, God, you know, because I'm chained in this marriage, I mean, it's keeping me from being happy and it's ruining my life. Well, maybe, maybe God has a greater purpose for life than happiness. I mean, maybe he wants to teach you to be holy. Maybe he wants to teach you what committed love like his looks like. Or maybe you feel chained to a gossipy, grumpy neighbor, you know, and you just come home every day just hoping there's going to be a for sale sign in his yard next door. You know, because if he would just move out of the neighborhood, then things would be better. And you've even thought about getting up in the middle of the night and putting a for sale sign in his yard. But maybe God has you chained to that neighbor because he wants that neighbor to see God's love through you. And you're thinking, God, is, is this really happening? I mean, I'm chained to this rebellious child. I'm chained to this broken down car. Why is it, I thought you wanted me to be comfortable. I thought you wanted me to be prosperous. I thought you wanted me to be happy. Well, maybe your greatest opportunity, it may be your greatest opportunity to glorify God and to show that you really trust him. Paul says, Paul says that his chains are what helped him to advance the gospel. So maybe you're chained to a health problem that you didn't expect. Maybe you're chained to a broken down body. I mean, maybe God has you, allowed you to be chained to that so that you, for a short time on this earth, can glorify him through your life. Stephen Brown, Pastor Stephen Brown, he said this one time. He said, every, every time a non-Christian gets cancer, God allows a Christian to get cancer so the world can see the difference. Now, I don't believe that's literally true, okay? I, I don't think the ratio is one-to-one. -one. But what he's saying is a very good point. That sometimes our greatest obstacles provide for us the greatest opportunity to show the world the God we serve. I was reading about Handel when he wrote the Hallelujah Course. His health and his finances were terrible. His right side of his body was paralyzed. His money was gone. He was living in debt. He was on the edge of imprisonment. And, and this is when he sat down and he penned the words to Messiah. You see, sometimes the chains that we feel like we're cursed with are God's greatest gift in order for us to accomplish his purpose through our lives. And so here's what I'm saying. Don't assume because you haven't gotten the job yet, because you're not making good grades, because you got dumped by your first true love, don't assume that God isn't at work. Because your child is diagnosed with an illness, because your business is going under, don't assume that God isn't able to work through those things to accomplish his purpose in your life. I mean, do you ever wonder what kind of influence Chuck Colson would have had if he had not been arrested? How about Johnny Erickson Tata if she had not had a diving accident leaving her quadriplegic when she was a teenager? What about um, Corey Ten Boom, if not thrown in a Nazi concentration camp? What about Jim Elliott and the other missionaries who were stabbed to death in the jungles? Sometimes that is when God works to accomplish his purpose. Look at verses 15 through 17, because Paul's going to switch gears here a little bit. He says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. They're jealous. But others out of goodwill, the latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition and not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in prison. So there are these preachers, these pastors in Philippi who are taking advantage of the situation. They're like, oh, Paul's in prison, so we're going to go out. We're going to use the gifts that we've been given. We're going to preach Christ, but we're going to do it in order to get promotion, in order to find prestige, in order to find popularity. And Paul's saying, hey, hey, don't, don't get caught up in that. It's easy. It can happen in any job. It can happen in any ministry. You get caught up in doing things for the wrong reasons, for the wrong purposes. Paul was not concerned about doing that. Paul's concern was Christ and Christ glorified. In verse 18, he said, this doesn't matter. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. In verse 16, I want you to catch a phrase there. He says, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. 
I am put here is a military phrase. It means in a military assignment. In other words, I am stationed here. This is where I've been assigned by God. And so that's the perspective that Paul had. So Paul is writing these words, and I'm sure as he's writing these words, these Roman guards who are chained to him, they're not that far away. They got to be at times looking over his shoulder. Right? I mean, it's kind of like you sitting here on a Sunday morning, and someone beside you is just writing, 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 and you're going, they cannot be taking notes on that sermon. <laughs> All right? And so you're going to look over their shoulder. What are they writing? Oh, it's their grocery list and their meal list for the week. You know? I mean, that's, that's what they're doing. And so he looks over the shoulder what Paul's writing, because Paul, I mean, he's on death row, basically. I mean, what does a guy on death row write about? You know, what does someone who doesn't know if they're going to be free or if they're going to die, what do they write about? And so he looks over Paul's shoulder. You know, what does someone who's scared to death write about? In verse 19, maybe this is what he reads. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He says, I, it doesn't matter if I live or die, I'm going to be delivered. Verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And so here's the second purpose, to always exalt Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, verse 21, here it is. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live, I get to glorify Christ. If I die, I get to be with Christ. And so you can tell he's got this thing going on. I don't know which is better. And he even goes on in verse 22. He says, if I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. In other words, I'm going to make a difference. Yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for me, for you, that I remain in the body. So he's just going back and forth. But here's the one thing that I want to make sure that you understand the purpose of Paul's life wasn't Paul. He was consumed with knowing Christ and making Christ known. And I was thinking this week, it would have been so easy for him to question God at this point. I mean, if he hadn't been arrested five years previous to this, I mean, think of how many churches he could have started. Think of how many cathedrals he could have preached in. Think of how he could have used his gifts. Basically, for five years of his life, he's been in prison. What he doesn't know is he's writing a good chunk of the New Testament that is going to be read by hundreds of millions of people in the future. And he doesn't know that on June 9th, 2017, we're going to be sitting in Millersburg Christian Church reading from his letter. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know how what you're chained to right now that God might use later to accomplish his purpose. So be faithful to him and just say, God for me to live is Christ. And in verse 27 of this section, he closes it with an application to his readers. He wants them to have the same perspective in life. Listen to what he says, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens. Now here's what I don't like about Paul's writings. It's all inclusive. Like there's never any loopholes. Whatever happens, which is what? Anything, everything, right? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ. But, but what if a tourist stops right in the road, right in front of me to take a picture of an Amish buggy? What about then? Whatever, whatever, even then. What if the coach doesn't play my child? What if my spouse annoys me? What if my child frustrates me? What if my boss overlooks me? What if my body doesn't heal? What about then? Whatever. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. What if the ump makes a bad call? What if my team loses? What if the boss calls me into his office and says, hey, we're downsizing? What about then? Whatever happens. Okay, what if my parents divorce? What if my spouse walks out on me? What if I lose my job? What if terrorists attack? What if I'm diagnosed with cancer? Whatever happens. Several years ago when I was ministering in Tennessee, I found myself in an emergency room one afternoon, surrounded by a family 
um, the couple, Roger and Jackie, had just started coming to our church about a month prior to this, and their son, Graham, was in a horrible car accident that day, and it didn't look like he was going to live. And I left the hospital that afternoon, and I just was asking, uh, because his, their son was the same age as my daughter. And I'm thinking, well, God, what is the purpose of this? Why is this happening? A few days later, he did pass away. And I have to tell you that through that period of time, Roger, the dad, he became an inspiration to me. He became someone that I truly looked up to. And I couldn't have been any more impressed with him than four months after his son passed away. Remember, they'd only been coming to our church for a month before that. Four months after his son passed away, he walked down and he said these words. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I accept him as my Savior. And I baptized him. He could have walked away from God. He could have walked away from church and never stepped foot in church again. He could have turned his back on God. I called him to ask if it was okay if I share the story. And this is what he says. It is my hope and prayer that in some way Graham's death will glorify God and make people stop and think about Jesus. So basically, through this horrible tragedy, Roger wants God to be glorified and the gospel to be advanced. Can I ask you one more time, what are you living for? What is your purpose? Is it your job? Is that what your calendar would show? Is that your priority to get a promotion, to make a better living, to have a better retirement? Maybe you're living for a little bit more something, more money, more prestige, power, hobby, sports team, Jesus? What are you living for? The purpose of the Christian life is to live for Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray. God, we come to you. We thank you uh, just so much for Jesus. Uh, we thank you for his death and what he suffered through in order that we would have freedom, freedom from sin. I mean, just looking, we look at Paul's life and we know the hardships and troubles Paul went through, but we also have to look to our Savior and the hardships and troubles that he went through, the beatings that he took, the crucifixion that he went through, the blood that he bled to cover our sins. And we thank you for that. Father, I pray for everyone in here, including myself, that we would look at our lives and that we would ask the question, hey, what am I living for? Because to be honest, a lot of times, I can say truthfully, it's not Christ. But your word says to live for Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's what we want to do. So help us all to focus on you, to focus on living for you, to make you the priority in our life, and to live for you each and every day. God, we love you, we praise you, and honor you at this moment. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.